when you talk to someone who hasn't looked into anything at all, they're like, oh, they'll just make more when they get to 21 million. It's like, there's so much depth to why that's not gonna happen. But that hit me like, oh, so this really is pretty much the only actually scarce thing out there. I think when you look at everything in terms of where to store your value, I don't think anything really comes close. Thoughts aren't truth. Thoughts are never truth. The story we tell ourselves is never the reality of the situation. You hear so often, someone's like, oh, they're not who I thought they were. But they were never who you thought they were. And you maintaining this solid idea of them is what caused you to get caught off guard when they didn't match that idea. Actually just being able to have conversations with each other and express ourselves freely. And so I think that's where I see Bitcoin fitting in, being the closest we can get to freedom when it comes to the monetary side of things. Introducing the Blockware Marketplace. Start mining Bitcoin today. This has the potential to transform the mining industry as now anyone can buy a Bitcoin ASIC using on-chain or Lightning, see its historical and live hash rate before purchasing, and be earning Bitcoin mining rewards in minutes. This brings transparency and turnkey mining to a whole other level. Start mining Bitcoin today at marketplace.blockwaresolutions.com. Dot com. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Blockware Intelligence Podcast. This week I have on Andrew Bernane. Andrew, welcome. Joe, thank you. Appreciate you having me on, man. Excited to chat. Absolutely. I I definitely think that you uh, are, are a new face to probably a lot of the Blockware audience, um, but you are famous on TikTok, so maybe people will recognize you. But for those that don't know you, who are you and what is your background? It's a great question. Um, so a little bit about my story, at least in, in regards to content and whatnot. A lot of the stuff I talk about is is basically things that have helped me feel a little bit more free in my life. And growing up, especially through high school, early teenage years, dealt with a good amount of insecurity for a while, had a lot of social anxiety and kind of figured out ways to not experience it to the depths that I was. Um, and over time, it kind of like progressed to feeling better and better and and not feeling those those pangs of nerves or feeling like I had nothing to say and like thinking there was something wrong with me and trying to trying to basically, I don't know, get get better and then started figuring out some ways to do so. And then eventually about three years ago, I was like, all right, I've, I've learned a lot of stuff. I might as well start sharing it. And even then it was still another sort of wall to get over was that ultimate sort of fear of judgment, fear of, of putting myself out there uh, on social media. And that was another big step for me. And then just kind of started posting stuff that I was interested in, posting stuff that had helped me overcome a lot of those things and kept doing so. I've been doing so for the last three years. Now got a podcast and I'm doing it full time and, and just continuing to dig into all of it. And, and basically now it's at a point where it's just like questioning <laughs> everything, both about reality, society, myself, and uh, all of the stories that I've told myself, understanding that the story is never actually the truth um, and seeing where it, where it takes me. So it's uh, kind of the cliff notes on on me <laughs> yeah i like it well it makes sense that you you know found bitcoin or were captivated by bitcoin if you started questioning everything so i guess how did, on that note like how did you get into bitcoin like what was your first touch point and you know where did where did you go from there yeah gotta gotta give a shout out to my buddy jake levison uh one of my best friends from college he was always <laughs> i feel like most people have like their token sort of crypto slash Bitcoin friend who's maybe been in it for a while. And he initially and, and he'll admit that he got into some crypto stuff like 2018 and, you know, invested in some stuff. And I don't know. I don't know exactly how it went, but probably not fantastically. And then focused solely on Bitcoin and got solely into that. And so it was June 2020, I think. And he texted me and my other buddy. Daniel and he was like, uh, "Do you guys have any Bitcoin?" And neither of us had any. I had just it was like coming out of the the pit of COVID with you know S and P 
dipping a ton and obviously Bitcoin dipping a ton, but hadn't really looked into that at all. So I had made some investments. So it didn't have, you know, a, a, a ton of liquidity on me. And both of us said no. And his immediate response was, you're both fucking idiots. And I was like, oh, OK, uh, that makes me a little bit curious. And I he had talked about it before and I had never really paid much attention to it. But he showed me some things. I think the initial thing he showed me was the stock to flow graph. And uh, I know it's it's not exactly followed that path, but it at least shifted my perspective on it a little because I had always looked at it like a typical stock. And it was like, you know, a little blip back early on, little blip every kind of four years, and then a bigger one uh, in in that period, 20, 2017-ish. And then uh, obviously the last run, 2021 was afterwards, but he, he showed me stock to flow and I was like, oh, there's actually more of a more of a trend here than it looks like on a typical stock graph. And so that made me scratch my head and then kind of got into the rabbit hole enough, started digging in and became very, very curious about it. And then I think the part that really stuck for me was the scarcity, um, how there's only 21 million. And I know people like when, when you talk to someone who hasn't looked into anything at all, they're like, oh, they'll just make more when they get to 21 million. It's like, there's so much depth to why that's not going to happen. And I'm not one, you know, I haven't quite looked into it enough to be able to like really w explain it probably as well as you could, um, why that's the case. But that hit me like, oh, so this really is pretty much the only actually scarce thing out there. And so understanding that, like that is, that is a very, very high degree of value, especially relative to fiat or any other crypto, like none of the other crypto things. And I had Ethereum for a while and uh, and eventually Jake kind of bullied me out of that too <laughs> and sent me some stuff about Ethereum's a scam. He sent me like, I, we were talking and I was like, yeah, I have a few. And he was like, dude, it's, it's, a, it's a scam too. And he sent me like eight articles and I, I was like skeptical at first and I was like, all right, you haven't led me astray yet. So uh, then I pretty much just went all into Bitcoin and, and now I'm at a point where I don't really have much money to put into anything else. So I don't, I haven't been down the rabbit hole in a while just because I don't have the option to invest much more, uh, into it. Cause it's already almost everything I got in, in different capacities, whether it's a uh, Bitcoin mining investment or Bitcoin itself, you know, on, I have a couple treasures that, uh, I now have, and that was a whole thing of moving it off of exchanges. Cause I had some situations with that, that, you know, you learn lessons the hard way. And oftentimes the only way to learn lessons is the hard way. Um, so yeah, now, now pretty much have it all on, on a cold wallet, but yeah, now been down the rabbit hole like two separate times and have a lot of conviction with it. And just when you weigh all of the options, maybe it's not like objective perfection. And I think really the only thing is just the amount of time it's been around, like the confirmation with that. But the longer it's it's around, the more people that are adopting it, the more that becomes more solid. Um, but I think when you look at everything in terms of where to store your value, I don't think anything really comes close. Yeah, 100%. I mean, in my view, it's it's definitely the most immutably scarce tool that humanity has ever discovered. And if that's the case, then it's probably the best money considering it has, you know, the best monetary properties of divisibility, portability, fungibility, etc. and so on. But yeah, that's awesome to hear your origin story. Um I want you touched on this a bit at the beginning, but I want you to dive in a little bit further on your podcast, on TikTok, on all of your channels where you produce content, what do you normally talk about? And then on each of those topics, can you like kind of relate or a couple of those topics, maybe your favorite ones, can you relate like how it may tie into Bitcoin? Yeah. Um, yeah, I will, I will do my best to do that. I was thinking beforehand of like ways to, to tie it directly or like cool ways to do so. I think really what it comes down to is freedom and freedom from be it on the side of the things that i typically talk about freedom from the stories that we tell ourselves freedom from the thoughts that we think thinking that there's any degree of truth that come along with them like the understanding that thoughts aren't truth thoughts are never truth the story we tell ourselves is never the reality of the situation like our idea of a thing is not the thing itself i think that's what a lot of my stuff comes down to is there is a underlying reality beyond the conceptual ideas of things 
a couple examples being, you know, we, we can maintain inside of our mind an idea of water. That's not the water that we're going to drink. We can maintain an idea of air. That's not the air we breathe, and it never, ever will be. Sure, the idea, someone could argue that, oh, that idea still exists in reality, but that idea is not the thing that you're having the idea about. And the same goes for you. You know, we maintain a, an idea of ourself. That idea, that story is not the reality of what we are. And and I think the reason that we cling to those stories, we want to believe that those ideas are the truth is because they provide us with some certainty, but it doesn't actually exist. And, it, and as much as it creates a cessation of the discomfort that comes with the uncertainty, like the rawness of uncertainty, of understanding that you can never actually know yourself conceptually. You can never actually know someone else. You know, you interact with someone, maybe it's a very good friend. You maintain an idea of them. That idea isn't them. So the idea is as much as we think they are beneficial, they're actually the thing that that cuts us off from the depth of the experience. Like when you're interacting with someone and say, just another example, like you're in a relationship with someone and, and you hear so often someone's like, oh, they're not who I thought they were. It's like they were never who you thought they were and you maintaining this solid idea of them is what caused you to get caught off guard when they didn't match that idea. And that's what we do going into situations. You know, we have an expectation of a situation or an idea of how we want the situation to go. And then if it goes that way, great. If it doesn't go that way, we're caught off guard. We, we feel like we're losing control. But if you understand that, you know, there was never certainty to begin with, there was never any control to begin with when you feel like, you know, you're in a spot where there isn't so much control, where you're sitting in that uncertainty. It isn't so scary. You don't panic quite so often because that is the reality of the situation. And I, so I know that was like a lot of different ways of kind of saying the same thing, but it comes back to the recognition that ideas aren't truth. The description of the thing is not the described. And uh, so when it comes to Bitcoin, I think it comes back to freedom and understanding that you know there's there's a lot tied to our current financial system and and fiat currency and if you want to be free it's like taking things for yourself in a sense and like actually having ownership of things can help you to have a little bit less weight and so when when things are being controlled and manipulated by other people it's going to have an impact on your experience and so something like money is is such a massive component of our society so the closer we can get to to actually having actual ownership <laughs> of things will will help in so many facets that we probably can't even understand right now until it starts to happen but we can see what's happening right now and and kind of the trajectory that we're on with something like fiat where there's not even basically any value to it whatsoever. Like they can just print a billion, a trillion more. And it's like that devalues the thing. So, so it comes back to taking, taking back that ownership, which allows for that, you know, degree of freedom. And I think freedom of thought, being able to have conversations freely, you know, we have cancel culture and all of that, like of <laughs> moving away from those things as best as we can and actually just being able to have conversations with each other and express ourselves freely. I think money is a is a component of that. And so I think that's where I see Bitcoin fitting in is uh, being the closest we can get to freedom when it comes to the monetary side of things. Yeah, 100%. Being free to actually own real money, I think is, is a critical point. Um, I had a guy on our podcast before his name's like Jimbo coin, but he's like a software engineer, smart guy. And he was talking about how Bitcoin is really in a way, the only asset that you can truly own. Like if you think about dollars in your bank account, it's like, that's someone else's mortgage. You have counterparty risk with the bank, the government or the fed can print a bunch of dollars and devalue your money. Anyways, you could store your wealth in equities, but then you got to trust the management team to like keep producing cash flows year after year after year, where 8 billion other people are competing to take those future cash flows from them and the management could mess up. They could do something illegal. They could make a mistake. Then you have bonds where it's like the promise of future dollars, which is just like kind of the same thing as money in your bank accounts, you know, can be easily to be devalued. Whereas like Bitcoin is like 
all you have to know is your secret key, your, your private key or your seed phrase. And if you, you know, run your own node, you can download the entire copy of the blockchain. You can set the rules yourself within the consensus of the network. And you know that, Hey, if I have one Bitcoin, I have one out of 21 million Bitcoin and no one can ever, you know, debase me as long as I keep running this node and I keep holding the private keys on my Trezor or whatnot. So it's like a whole nother level of like freedom and ownership. It's to me, it's like, thinking back before Bitcoin, it would be kind of scary living in a world not owning Bitcoin because it gives you that like next le level of freedom and, and confidence that like, hey, like, I actually have something real. Like this isn't all just made up, but I don't yeah. know if you have any following thoughts there. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I think I think I like that you brought that up because I think it a big part of both sides of be it Bitcoin or uh, things I talk about in, in regards to having faith in yourself is it does come back to trusting yourself. And I think that's a big part of people's hesitation with that. We're so used to relying on other people, having other people think for us. You know, we, we have, you know, the, the two party split in the U.S. And if you fall on one side or the other, you don't really make a decision for yourself on your stance on something until your party comes up with their perspective of it. And I saw that during COVID. I, uh, I had some people I worked with who initially had some thoughts about what was going on. And then all of a sudden, the side of the aisle that they fell upon totally changed their perspective. And, and the next day, I was like, what the fuck just happened? It's like, oh, they came out with their overarching stance on the situation. And so that completely changed your perspective on it. And so I think when it comes to Bitcoin, like people I've talked to, even, even my parents, like I've kind of steered clear of trying to convince anyone of doing anything like in general like initially when i was feeling more free in in myself understanding that you know the stories that i told myself weren't ever going to be the reality of me i was i was like talking to everyone about it and trying to convince everyone to like you know question what you think like that thing you're holding on to it's not it's not actually the truth and the same with bitcoin you know i was like oh you got to you got to get some you got to get some bitcoin and i've i've kind of stopped doing all of those things um because it ha it has to come from the person i found that it's actually a much uh maybe not so much with bitcoin cuz people aren't willing to look into it for themselves as much but when you when you're feeling more free in yourself and you're kind of expressing that freedom it, it gets people a little bit curious and uh, causes them that curiosity to dig into things a little bit more as opposed to you trying to impose your will upon them. And something I, I realized with people, and this ties into having trusting yourself, having faith in yourself, is that, you know, when people realize, oh, you put it on a cold wallet, like, that's on you. That's your responsibility. Like, that's kind of a big responsibility. Like, you fuck up, you, you lose those keys, something happens, like, shit's gone. Like you're not getting it back and people are so not used to that. They're so not used to having responsibility for the things that they own. It's like, you know, you put it and we've seen it even with uh, what was the recent one, like SVB with all of those things that happened, like big daddy government came in and, and saved the day. It's like, what sort of what sort of uh, precedent is that going to set moving forward? Like there, there's no regard for not taking a fuckload of risk in the future. And is that okay if I curse, by the way? Is that cool? Okay. Yeah, definitely. Right. Okay, no, <laughs> that was good. So like with something like that, it's like there's no incentive to not be a little bit careful or to actually consider the implications of certain actions. Because if you know that there's this massive safety net behind you, you're not going to have to worry about that. And so with the whole thing and you know i don't exactly know the depths of the details with that but i know that the government came in and kind of saved the day essentially um in in not so many words and uh so it's going to incentivize them to to not change and so i think with individuals we're so used to having safety nets and backups when it comes to having our money in a bank or owned by people but at the same time it's like it's like a facade of a backup because things come crumbling down and we saw it with uh with like celsius you know i had i had a, some friends who worked there had all their money in celsius and it was like oh it, it's just something it's it's not going to fail because we don't think that things like that can fail and then until they do and then all of a sudden you're totally fucked and uh so when it comes to bitcoin like actually having the responsibility is having that ownership but but with it comes a little bit more, 
I don't know, risk in the sense of personal risk, but also it's like, it's in your control as opposed to in someone else's hands. And I think that's the overarching shift I'm starting to see with society, with people moving away from belief systems, kind of thinking for themselves a little bit more, not not banking on what someone else tells them the, the right way to live or, you know, the things that they have to do to be happy. People are starting to realize that all of those things we were told, like the whole American dream, the whole thing that we kind of relied upon through the you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, like isn't working in the same way anymore. We're both connecting at a, at a larger scale, but also being more individualistic in a sense as well, and not relying upon, you know, the ar- overarching big government structures as much anymore. We're starting to see those crumble and kind of, kind of, implode within themselves and so i think we're seeing that with the the money with personal experiences in people's lives with any sort of thing that we've relied upon um for that sense of security and certainty we're we're realizing that oh that doesn't actually guarantee anything so as that happens both in our personal lives people start thinking for themselves more i think inevitably it's going to come around to money especially you know we start seeing the U.S. dollar, what is it, like uh, world reserve currency usually lasts only about 250 years and uh, the clock's ticking on that. So I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, bricks coming around pretty quick here um, if that starts to shift. And with that sort of shakedown, I think there's going to be a lot more focus on something that you can actually own um, being being Bitcoin. And I don't even remember where I started with that. But yeah, I think I think there's a lot of shifts going on and they're they're interconnected with Bitcoin as well. Yeah, that was really good. It, it was interesting the point that you brought up earlier about like post COVID, you had like kind of the blue team and the red team and, and like politics and people were just kind of like cheering on their team, didn't really decide to think for themselves. And and I think a big part of that is like the money is just fundamentally broken. And over the last 50 something years, it's like government has gotten bigger and bigger because when things go wrong, like that's the the safety net that comes in and and saves the day, whether it's like the banking system, the housing market, um, tech or whatever. I mean, most, if, if things get bad enough COVID, if things get bad enough quick enough, then they come in and government gets bigger and, and things get bigger. And so people like start cheering on their team and they think that like cheering on their team is going to fix the problem when it's more like maybe we need to be building and using tools that empower the individual like Bitcoin and maybe take power or not take power, but distribute power less towards large corporations, large governments and, and push the power more towards individuals um, and give them, you know, the right uh, to, to do what they please. And, and I think the world is kind of better off when individuals do think for themselves and have the tools to, you know, be, be powerful and to, to make things happen and to build things that people want. Oh, absolutely. And I I think we're so caught in the idea that control actually exists and certainty actually exists that when you start talking about things like, Oh, what, what's going to make for a better world? It's like, we can't, we can't get to a spot where we understand what's going to make for a better world until we start taking that responsibility on ourselves and finding out, how that better world is expressed through us like understanding at our core what we are like universal intelligence we're the product of billions of years of evolution and we we layer these stories these these thoughts about ourselves, our perception or our value on top of that so that that kind of numbs that intelligence from being expressed and and because we have all of these overarching systems and and this desire to fit in we just kind of like pigeonhole ourselves you know we're constantly putting square pegs into round holes or or at least trying to and and cutting off that universal intelligence that we are from acting and so when we come back to allowing that to act not relying upon those larger overarching mechanisms of you know perceived control to tell us what to do and start thinking for ourselves it's like the best world is going to be the product of us doing it for ourselves and and so we can't right now say what it's going to look like or or how we should do things because that's not what's happening right now it's like the perfect world or or a more ideal world is going to be an expression of people taking responsibility 
for themselves of moving away from these larger governmental structures and whatnot. And and there's so many different components of that, of, of the structures that we rely upon. And I think as we come back to taking responsibility for ourselves, we're going to start finding out more and more what that is. And I, I think, I don't think people recognize how, how big the money is, like how, how big of a component money is in that as much as it's, you know, people will say it's not real. It's just like energy and, and it is at its core. Like that's, that's what it is. Um, it is still something that sort of drives things. And, and we're even seeing with the way that money is now, it's like the value that we perceive it to have is told to us in a sense. Like it's, it's, it's something that's very much outside of our control because we can say like, oh, I have a hundred dollars right now, but you know, in a few days it can be worth $99 relative to what it was then. And so with something like Bitcoin, we can actually point to it as something that, that has value in and of itself, not this relative sort of value. And, and so I think as all of those things start to be realized more and more, we're going to start finding out what that world looks like. But given our current mentality of like the desire for control, when, when I point out something like the system's broken, people respond like, okay, well, what's, what's a better system? Like, what's your answer to it? And it's like, I don't have an answer, but you don't have to have an answer in order to recognize the brokenness of the current system. And it's that it's the underlying mentality and the desire for, for certainty. It's like that, that desire to know what the best situation is that needs the shift because it that brings us back to having faith in ourselves and and the ability to find out what the best case situation is through us that'll be a product of us taking back responsibility and and money is a big component of that yeah 100 percent. i mean i think like society and economic systems like converge on one best money and i think after 2009 that was bitcoin and it's like people don't, I guess, recognize the importance of that. Like they see number go up technology and they're like, why does this thing keep going up? And like, it goes down, you know, 80% and then it goes back up like 10 X and like, why is this thing not dying? But it does require responsibility, right? Like if you had your coins on Mt. Gox or FTX or Celsius or BlockFi or now prime trust, it's like, you didn't really have your coins. Um, so people like are recognized. I think people, over the last 13 years and over the next 10 plus years are going to keep recognizing that like maybe this Bitcoin thing is the best money. Maybe it's the best like long-term savings technology, but I need to like acquire some and I need to do it in the right manner and I need to take responsibility for myself. And I think that that's kind of like the natural and economic incentive to do so. Like, Cause if you don't take responsibility for yourself, then you don't end up with any Bitcoin. You end up with worthless Bitcoin IOUs. So yeah, I think that's really interesting. Like responsibility is a key aspect of Bitcoin. And I think thankfully, like the incentives are to take responsibility. And maybe in the past, it hasn't been the case with, you know, outsourcing your your wealth management to buy a bunch of, you know, bonds and equities and, fu- you know, future dollars and, and treasury T-bills or whatnot. It's like now it's like, you don't have to do that. You can do it yourself and it's actually better. And you're probably going to outperform, you know, that 60, 40 portfolio potentially. Oh yeah. We're, we're so used to like outsourcing our mind, basically trying to get someone to tell us the right way to do something, you know, following the directions, following what people have done before, following the proven methods. And so I think with <clears throat> Bitcoin, I almost see it as like, uh, this this period that we're in right now and, and maybe coming out of a little bit more is like the the shift from putting all of our uh, faith in something outside of us to putting all of it inside of us. And, and so when, because we still see people utilizing exchanges so much. And, and so it's like a, almost like a interim period i think of it as where and i certainly went through this as well like we think that oh having bitcoin and having it on coinbase or binance or ftx or or whatever platform you have it on like that's still it and it's like no it's still yeah you you have bitcoin so you'll you'll make the money from it sure but like you you still don't own it and so i think people find out 
what that actually is. And it's not just about Bitcoin. It's about ownership and, and the freedom that comes with that, but also the responsibility. And so with Bitcoin, it's almost like a representation of responsibility and, uh, and uncertainty <clears throat> simultaneously because we don't know what it's going to look like necessarily and we don't have this sort of future focused projection and that's what like you see it in companies all the time you want to you want to figure out what your goals are for the quarter and that's like again i'm not like a huge finance guy by any means but i always find it funny how people and, and companies will come up with projections and then based on how they hit them or don't hit them is like how the stock does and how it responds to it. And it's always based off of just this future desire for certainty. And people want to invest in the certainty. How certain can this person be that this is going to go in the way that we think? And there isn't that with Bitcoin. We don't have a projection moving forward. It's like continued faith in what's real, like the most valuable thing you can possibly own in it. And so it it when you take take into consideration and and the context of everything and all of the things that you could possibly invest your money in like it makes sense or or just own not even invest your money because it's not even an investment it's an ownership thing like the things that you can own which thing has the most value and you look into real estate you look into gold you look into to you know stocks and it's it comes down to bitcoin if you're willing to look like you'll see that that inherently has the most value. And it's just having the faith to allow that conviction to play out in a sense, because we want the immediate, we want someone to tell us that it's the right thing, but it's really like taking it on for yourself, like doing your own research, figuring it out for yourself. And, and the more people that are willing to do that and actually look as opposed to listen to what everyone else is doing or look back, because you can't even look back in past sort of, uh, uh, performance of things because like there isn't a long history of bitcoin like it's super super new relative to all the other mechanisms and things that you could invest in so it's just looking at things for what they are right now you know what has the most value and i don't think anything holds a candle or a stick to bitcoin yeah it, it's almost like the words money and ownership like they didn't really exist before bitcoin like it was kind of like another level of money or another level of ownership that actually makes that word like maybe more meaningful uh now um i know there's one thing that you, you you've said i on your tiktok before that i've saw and, and you said knowing is closing your eyes to reality so i'm curious like how do you dive more into this like how do you deal with uncertainty and worry hey everyone this week i want to talk about stamp seed this is very cool metal plate where you can literally stamp your bitcoin seed phrase with this hammer that they sell you into this metal plate this is a must have for all bitcoin holders if you have taken self custody of your bitcoin you want to make sure you've recorded your seed phrase on something that is fireproof waterproof and time resistant this is a great product for Bitcoiners who have taken self-custody and want that extra level of security and resiliency to store their Bitcoin. So if you are interested in this product, definitely check out stampseed.com. Use code BLOCKWARE15 for 15% off the entire website. Um, yeah, great question. So uh, knowing closing your eyes for reality. So there's a, <clears throat> so when you feel like something is known it's based on the past situation so like i'll i'll try and come up with a couple examples like with a person say you think you know someone that's just based on all of the historical experiences that you've had with them and and so say you had a friend who you've known for a number of years you haven't seen him in a year you have this idea of them maintain this idea and then you meet them again and it's like they're a lot different so you thought you knew them, but you didn't. So you weren't actually seeing them for what they were. Because the only true knowledge is here and now. The only true 
knowing, be it of yourself, be it of reality, being it, be it of other people, is here and now. Everything else is a conceptual idea. And so when we settle upon a certainty, it causes us to usually feel a little bit better just because sitting in that spot of uncertainty of feeling like we don't know is a little bit uncomfortable. So we just make the assumption that we know, but it's just assumption. It's not actually reality. And so when you do say that you know something, it's like closing your eyes to it. You're no longer seeing it for what it is because reality is change in motion. Like we are change in process, like change just continuing to play out. And so if you say that you know something with absolute fact and absolute uh, certainty, it's like closing your eyes to the reality of the situation. So understanding that you don't know, you continue to keep your eyes open. You know, you continue to see things for what they are. You're not so caught off guard. You're, you're not necessarily coming to a perfect conclusion, but you're at least continuing to gain context of the situation. And so when someone says that they know something, it's like they, they kind of stop looking at the thing. Like when, when you say that, you know, yourself, like a lot of people will say like, oh, I, I, I know myself now. And even in society, we say like, it's the most important thing you can ever do is, is know yourself. And for most people, it's just coming up with a conceptual idea of themselves, what they like, what they don't like, what they're good, what they're bad at. And so they don't continue to find out what they're capable of because they'd rather just settle upon an idea of themselves. But that inherently hinders your potential. Like just because you think you're good or bad at something, especially on the on the negative side, but they kind of go hand in hand. But when you think that you're bad at something, most of the time when someone settles upon that, it's it's based on very, very little evidence. Maybe they've done it once. Maybe they did it when they were, you know, 10 years old. They tried something, tried something, they got embarrassed. And so they just said, I'm bad at that thing. It's based off one little situation. And if they had just gone through it and done it, you know, 10, 100, 1,000 more times, maybe then they were good at it. And so this whole idea, this conceptual idea of knowing things, knowing yourself, knowing what's happening in reality cuts us off from what's actually happening. And as you come back to that uncertainty and understanding that everything is is inherently uncertain all the time, you continue to pay attention to it. Because when you settle upon the certainty, it's it's like closing your eyes to that thing because you don't feel like you have to keep looking. And then there's consequences to closing your eyes as you continue to walk through reality. You're caught off guard by so many more things. You cut off your potential. You uh, you hinder your ability to, to step into new and uh, uncharted territory. And it's kind of like building a prison for yourself. And I think a lot of people exist in conceptual prisons. You know, their idea of themselves, their idea of, of the right way to live, their idea of the right beliefs to hold on to is like it becomes this sort of prison meanwhile the entire time the prison door has been open but what's outside of that you don't know and so most people would rather just stay in that little confined prison as opposed to being free and finding out what's possible you don't know what's outside that door you don't know if it's going to be frightening if it's going to be you know something you perceive as as good or bad uncomfortable or, or comfortable but at least you're free at least you're continuing to find out and so it's not to say that there's anything wrong with, you know, maintaining a conceptual idea of something and maintaining that prison that you're kind of just existing and willingly continuing to exist within. But when, when you compare it to freedom, I don't know. I, I think that freedom, at least for me, is, is a much better option than sitting in a little, you know, eight by eight prison cell. Yeah, it's truly fascinating to think about that. And think about reality that way. It, using the word uncertain is interesting because um, the VP of research at Riot, Pierre Richard, I don't know if you've followed him on Twitter, or you've seen some of his work on podcasts and Nakamoto Institute was where I discovered Bitcoin many years ago. But he talks about Bitcoin being the least uncertain asset, meaning like it's not perfect. You know, it's good. It's the best there is by far but it's just the least uncertain. And so it's like, we don't know anything for sure. I mean, anything could happen, but Bitcoin is by far the least uncertain, which makes it the best money. So I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, way to wrap, tie that into to that. Um, 
another topic that I, that you talk about sometimes is like achieving peace. Like what are your thoughts around how people can achieve peace? Um, yeah. Um, so I think the, my quick answer to that is that it isn't something that's achieved. It's something that's more so allowed to arise within you. And, uh, it's allowed to arise when you stop wanting to be anywhere other than where you are basically. And it's not to say that it, it means that you're in an objectively comfortable situation, but even in discomfort, you can still find peace through letting go of the idea that you should be anywhere else. You know, if you, if you're experiencing even mentally or emotionally, you know, you're, you're going through a difficult spot, you're dealing with anxiety or concern or worry. There's always this underlying belief that there's something wrong, that there, that things should be different than they are. And through recognizing that they can't be any different than they are. Like the way that things are right now is the way that things are right now. They couldn't be any different when they are different. They are the way they are right now. And so letting go of our resistance to a situation, no matter how brutal, no matter how awful, no matter how difficult it is, allows some cessation of that resistance, some cessation of that stress, which allows us to feel a little bit differently, to see things a little bit differently. And uh, it's even, and my podcast co-host uh, brought this point up and we were talking about this uh, about a month ago, how people think that, you know, they're going through a situation, thinking through a certain situation, they're having a tough time or, or like struggling with intrusive thoughts or whatever. And they have to think other thoughts in order to get out of that. And so we think that using thoughts is the way to get out of certain thought patterns. But the reality is that with each experience on the spectrum from stress to relaxation, there are different thoughts that come with each of those experiences in yourself. So when you're stressed out, there's going to be certain thoughts, the desire for things to be different, the you know confirmation in your mind of, of what's happening and how it shouldn't be happening and, and all of this sort of tension and resistance. And so we think that we have to think, you know, people say like, oh, just think happy thoughts and that'll change everything. It's like, it doesn't, the reality doesn't work out like that. The reality is that as you relax, the thoughts shift with that relaxation. And so what's the best way to relax? Letting go of the idea that things should be different than they are. Letting go of the idea that you should be in another spot than you are, you know, where you're at in life. Oh, I thought I would be at this point by the time I was 30 or 40. Letting go of the idea that you should have ever been anywhere else, that you should be anywhere else other than where you are right now. It doesn't change the situation, but it changes your perspective enough to like, you know, the shoulders drop a little bit. You start looking around and you're like, okay, so things are as they are. I'm not quite as stressed anymore because I don't think that I should be in another spot. And so I think peace is, is very much tied into that. Like that's when a little bit more peace arises. And I'm not saying like, you know, the, the whole toxic positivity thing of just like, oh, just let go of that idea and you'll immediately feel amazing. It's not necessarily going to make you feel amazing, but it's going to shift things enough to see things a little bit differently. And so another way I, I like to express this is with with suffering, like that idea that you should be in another spot is the experience of suffering. And so, you know, we're always in this the spot that we're in here and now feeling what we're feeling going through what we're going through in the situation that we're in and then we have this idea of where we should be in life you know what i should be experiencing right now what i should be going through the reality is we don't know any of those things but we come up with these conceptual ideas and the gap between where you're at and where you think you should be be it physically mentally emotionally is the suffering gap all the time that's where psychological suffering exists is in that gap and so when you let go of those ideas and the false certainty that you're holding on to thinking that you know with absolute truth that that's where you should be and it's not where you are now you come back to looking around where you're at you start gaining a little bit more context of the situation that you're in as opposed to having this tunnel vision towards being in another spot in another specific spot that you feel like you know you should be in despite having no fucking idea if that's the spot that you should be in and so as those gaps go away, as those perception of, of where you think you should be start to drop, the peace begins to arise. You look at things a little bit differently, that perspective shifts, and you're actually able to start taking steps to shift that situation. But as long as you're thinking that you should be in another spot, that tension, that resistance kind of locks you up. It's, it's like you're not free to move around to see things differently. And so 
that's where at least a degree of peace arises, but that's kind of always where it comes from. So just bringing it all back to peace, you know, we think that peace is one of those things also that we should be at. I should be at peace right now. I wish I was at peace right now. I want to be at peace right now. If we feel like we're not at peace right now, we're going to experience a lot of tension and resistance that will not allow that peace to arise. And it's it's not that peace is somewhere that you get to or that you achieve. It's something that's allowed to arise when you let go of the idea that you should be and that you know with certainty that you should be in a different spot than you're in. 100%. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Another uh, one of my favorite topics that I've heard you speak on before is the idea that like, okay, are people all around us judging us all the time? Are they constantly thinking about us? Or are they not? Um, oh, yeah, judgment. Uh, that's, that's a good one. So <clears throat> it's interesting, because when, when people judge, so like, the reality is that most of the time, people aren't thinking about you. It's not to say that they're never doing so. But when you really look at and and say you were to exist in someone else's mind for their entire day, like the amount of time we spend thinking about ourselves and the situation that we're in, the situations that we're going through, and you know, we have families and friends and jobs and all that shit. Like that takes up ninety nine point nine percent of our day. In passing, sure, we see someone, we judge them, we think a certain thing, but we're not actually seeing them because what they are is not our assumptions of them. And so when we judge someone, we judge our assumptions of them because that's all that we can do. There is no objective them that we're looking at and and we see them and, and we see them in a certain way and that's just our assumptions. Like, And it's the same with everyone. I was talking before about that uncertainty. You know, You interact with a friend or a family member or a random person on the street. You have an idea of them. That's not actually what they are. Because they, they aren't an idea. They aren't a conceptual idea. But we maintain these conceptual ideas and stories and think that that's reality. And it isn't. And so when people judge, even if they do judge you, all they're doing is judging their assumptions about you. And usually it stems from themselves. You know, what we what we judge in other people is what we're either trying to avoid or, or afraid of in ourselves for the most part, or it's something even that we're jealous of. You know, we see someone acting in a certain way that maybe is absurd, but deep down, we, we kind of wish that we had the, you know, audacity or conviction or confidence to act in the way that we're acting. So in order to avoid looking at it within ourselves, we just judge them. And that allows us to avoid looking at it within ourselves. So majority of the time, people aren't judging us. But you know, again, we like to, we'd rather have that false certainty and that, you know, sweet, sweet certainty than, than the uncertainty and the recognition that we can't actually know what that person thinks of us or where they're coming from or, or what they're going through that causes them to act in any given way. And so when, even when someone judges us, it's just their assumptions of us that they're judging. And so when you see that, it's like, it, it, it gets a little bit tougher to at least taking all of that in to fear it so much because we're just fearing our own perceptions of what they think of us because a lot of people would rather know that people are judging them than come back to the recognition that oh maybe no one is actually thinking about me like we'd rather someone be thinking about us in a negative way than recognizing that oh maybe maybe no one's actually thinking about us which maybe doesn't have as much weight but it also can bring up those feelings of of loneliness and feeling alone that i think is the ultimate thing that we're uh we're always trying to avoid wow yeah very interesting uh one more question then we can wrap it up and we you kind of touched on this a little bit and i think it ties in a little bit to bitcoin and like responsibility but should people out there try to change the world or should they try to change themselves first? And maybe they're a little bit intertwined. Oh yeah. Uh, fantastic question. Um, so this kind of ties into what I was talking about before with our, our desire to know the best way to do things. And if people want to try and change the world right now, it's based on their assumptions of the world right now and we, and we try and do things to change everything but with the existing mentality that we're experiencing currently and that perception of of division so i think the most important thing that anyone can do 
if they want to change the world is recognize that they are the world that they are reality you know it's like uh like a tapestry or a blanket and and threads within the blanket like we're all threads within the same blanket and without the threads there's no blanket like there's no blanket that exists without the threads all of those threads get pulled there's no blanket we're all of those threads everything in all of reality are those threads and so we're we're intrinsically tied to reality we are reality we are the universe we are the world and so in order to change the world the only thing you have to ever have to do is change yourself and so i think that connection is both internal and external or could be perceived as internal and external because when you understand that you are the world this is all an interconnected experience like there isn't actually division that isn't just a perceived division a conceptual division based on the labels and the names that we hold on to there is both an internal and an external impact like we're all components of of the same mind and i know we don't have a ton of time so like we don't have to get to i could probably dig into this for another for another hour but we're all tapping into that same mind like we are all that same mind and so as you change yourself yourself changes and and it's not only from the internal of your mind changing changes the collective mind but as being an example of that change everyone you you interact with changes but it's that desire to change other people that allows us to avoid the changes in ourself it's kind of funny when when people run around trying to change the world it's like they don't like to hear that they're holding on to an underlying assumption that they're perfect it's like okay if you're trying to change everyone else you're you're assuming that you don't have to change why is that and then you know you bring that up and someone will be like well no i don't i don't actually think that but you know i'm i'm, I'm in a better spot than than them and it's like that's just assumption too based on how you're seeing yourself and so i think it's really it's not really something like a superficial change that we need it's an underlying mentality shift that we need and it's the same with you know the money shifting and people taking responsibility for bitcoin it's like people taking responsibility for themselves their own experience like you see a lot of people running around like all the all the warriors out there trying to change the world meanwhile they're fucking suffering all the time like they're miserable inside of themselves and like you're trying to change everyone else and yet your experience is miserable like why don't you focus on that and then your perspective of the people that you're interacting with all of your interactions all of your the things that you're going through are going to shift and when it comes to changing ourselves versus changing other people like it's the the thought the the attempt to change other people is a lot easier than the attempt to change ourselves because it takes all that responsibility to change yourself but the reality of changing other people versus changing ourselves it's a lot easier to change ourselves despite it being a lot more a lot tougher of a pill to swallow to change ourselves and then on the external changing other people it's easier to try to do it's way 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 more difficult to actually do but people just want to feel better people want to feel like they're making changes as opposed like they'll take the feeling of change over the reality of shifts and changes and so if you really want to change the world the best way to do it is to change yourself because you are the world and the impact that you have on that is going to be way easier because the reality of when you try and change other people usually there's there's pushback like people don't want to be changed they want to think for themselves deep down they want to feel like they're taking responsibility for themselves and so you coming in to change them even if even if you're able to, it creates this sort of reliance then upon you and then they aren't building that faith in themselves. And so as much as you feel like you're changing and now you're feeling better, the reality of the impact isn't as extreme or as as impactful long term as it could have been if you just focused on yourself and expressed that and just shared things for the sake of doing so as opposed to this underlying desire to change the world because most of the time people are just doing that in order to try and feel a little bit better about themselves. Yeah. On the note of being, you know, each individual human being so interconnected with like the world and each other, I've, I've heard people call Bitcoin like a digital organism, basically like made up of nodes and private keys and people. And that's honestly like a weird way to describe it, but I think it actually makes a lot of sense. So 
But this is awesome, Andrew. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Where can people learn more about you and, and what you're doing? Yeah, I am uh, on social media, TikTok, Instagram, not Andrew Renane on Twitter, but don't use that as much. That's pretty much just like my my Bitcoin spot. I think I only follow people in, in Bitcoin on Twitter and like a couple of friends from high school, and that's about it. Um, and then uh, my podcast is Dualistic Unity. Um, so you can find that on all podcast platforms, um, dualsecurity.com. We got all our all our stuff there. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's where where you can find me. Yeah, everybody needs to go check out Andrew's stuff. I remember like a year or two ago, I got like a notification on my Twitter thing that said like Andrew followed you on Twitter. And I was like, I've seen this guy's profile picture before. And I'm like, wait, I follow this guy on TikTok. He has like a million followers on TikTok. This is weird. And then I followed you back and DM'd you. So it was actually cool to finally meet you as I, I I've seen your face and I've heard your voice so many times. Cool to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been great chatting, Joe. And I th I feel like uh, my buddy Jake, who got me into Bitcoin, was following you. And maybe I, I was asking him who to follow on Twitter and, and he had mentioned you. So I'm glad we were finally able to connect. But I love everything you're doing, man. It's going to be exciting to see how this all plays out. But I am absolutely in it for the long haul, you know the the 40 50 60 year uh investment in it uh very much thinking long term with things so i'm sure we'll we'll connect again at some point but i appreciate you having me on the podcast 100 percent. this is awesome thanks andrew